Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your day to come and see me talk. I uh, hope it's interesting and useful. Who's excited about Kubernetes? Woo! Yeah, cool, awesome. I am. I've been, I've been excited about Kubernetes for three years. And we're going to talk about Kubernetes in the cloud uh, with Puppet and with Google Container Engine. Uh, I normally talk about Kubernetes. I rarely talk about Google Container Engine. This is not really a product pitch, uh, but the way the Puppet module works, it's more aligned using, to using Container Engine than to just Kubernetes on its own. Uh, the countdown clock hasn't started, by the way. So you might want to start that. Yeah, I've got extra minutes now. <laughs> awesome. So I'm Andy Waits. Uh, I am uh, advocacy TLM at Google. Uh, we, in the advocacy team, uh, we work with practitioners, uh, not just developer advocates anymore. We're now uh, DevOps advocates, SRE advocates, data science advocates. Uh, we take practitioners, uh, people with deep knowledge of these areas, uh, and we get them to advocate uh, on that on the behalf of the community that they represent. Uh, so uh, DevOps advocacy is a, a new thing we're doing. Uh, we're hiring DevOps people uh, to do that kind of role. So if you're a practitioner and interested in doing that kind of work, then come and see me uh, at the Google booth afterwards. Uh, on Twitter, I am at TechGirl. Uh, you can tweet me on there. Uh, and I'm going to give you some background first. Uh, so I could spend a lot of time talking about uh, Kubernetes generally. Uh, I could spend a small amount of time talking about the module, uh, but I think I'll give you some background as to why we actually built Kubernetes in the first place. Uh, and I hope this is interesting. I mean, I've given this talk many times. I, I think this, this context is lacking often when it comes to Kubernetes. Uh, so I think it might help you understand why we have Kubernetes, where we're going with it. So basically back in 1999, uh, we saw in five months a 10x growth uh, in terms of traffic, 50,000 requests. Uh, up to 500,000 in just the space of five months. Uh, we were obviously on a, a very interesting journey. Uh, we could see that at that rate of growth, uh, there was no way traditional infrastructure was going to scale. Uh, so we had to do something different. Ultimately, the idea would be to build data centers. This is a fairly new data center in uh, uh, Iowa, Council Bluffs, Iowa. Uh, this isn't one of the original ones, but building data centers was part of that plan. But when you have data centers like this, it becomes incredibly difficult to give that infrastructure in any meaningful way to your software engineers. So how do you get a software engineer to actually deploy code here, uh, running code? Uh, do they have to find a specific machine and a specific rack and a specific cell and a specific data center? That's not the best way forward. So what we need to do is be able to insert this kind of control plane between the hardware infrastructure and the software engineers. And then they can just kind of build their binaries, uh, create a configuration and say, run this for me. That's what we needed. Couldn't really quite do it to begin with. Uh, processes don't move around very well. They have dependencies. Uh, so what was really needed was some kind of mechanism by which we could schedule work uh, anywhere within a cluster. Uh, and obviously, the idea of uh, containers started with Chiru. It progressed through things like BSD jails, Solaris zones. Who's sad about Solaris being end of life by Oracle? Uh, I used to work at Sun Microsystems, and Solaris has now been end of life, uh, which is really, really sad. Uh, but yeah, so there are mechanisms for doing containerization. Uh, and some of the key aspects of containerization in our heads was at least uh, things like building images. And going back to statically linked binar uh, binaries, statically linked bundles which had all of their dependencies encapsulated within them. They're moving away from dynamic linking back to static linking. So we could effectively encapsulate the entire application environment within the binary. Uh, that would make it more schedulable. But there are other things we need as well. For this, we need something like Linux application containers, uh, ultimately what became LXC. Uh, things like capabilities and shoe routes were already around. Uh, but we worked to build C groups and namespaces with other people. We contributed to it significantly. Uh, and C groups and namespaces effectively enabled the ability to run containers, uh, Linux application containers, what fundamentally Docker is based on today. And so uh, this capability, this uh, Linux application container mechanism, would give us the ability to do the scheduling that we needed. And then for that, we could then build the system that we needed, which is, oh, I should mention the Mr. Men as well. How many of you know the Mr. Men? Yay, not many of you do. It's, like, it's so sad. I should give this presentation in, in the UK. I've not done it yet. <laughs> but basically, Linux application containers allow us to protect from noisy neighbors, from nosy neighbors, and messy neighbors. OK, I, I think you can understand that, right? I'm not going to go into it in any more detail. But ultimately, we take signed static bundles and Linux containers, uh, add them together. 
we can effectively isolate applications from all of the environments that they effectively run in. So you can run these binaries anywhere. And all of the dependencies, all of the isolation is available through the container mechanism. So once we have that, we can then build a system to be able to schedule those containers uh, for us. We can get back to that situation or get to that situation we wanted whereby we provide a control plane and now we can allow our software engineers to declaratively say what they want to run, uh, provide a binary, provide configuration, and then we can run it for them. And so we invented this thing uh, called Borg, and this is the system that we use internally today. Uh, and Borg runs in a cell. A cell is a cluster of machines. If you remember that data center I showed you, uh, that's a cluster. Uh, we have a cell within that, which is a, a, a small number of machines, thousands of machines, but smaller than the entire cluster. And we have Borg within each of these cells. Uh, we have Borg masters replicated. Uh, and the Borg masters effectively uh, store the configuration, the expected state of the cell. Uh, so this is stored into uh, a persistent store, which is consensus-based uh, using Paxos. And then we have a scheduler that comes along and says, let me look at what the desired state is and what the current state is uh, and make sure they are the same. And so the scheduler reads the configuration. It has a fleet of machines at its disposal. Uh, these are all the machines at the blue, the, in the blue boxes at the bottom uh, with ball glitz running. Uh, and they instruct the ball glitz to run work for them. So they do the scheduling. They say they decide which machine it is, and the ball glitz running on each, each machine is instructed to run that work. And all of these gray and white black boxes at the bottom are containers, effectively. They're not full-blown Linux containers. Uh, they are much more lightweight. Uh, we don't use Docker or anything like that, but we do have our own container mechanism. Uh, we have a, there's a project on GitHub called LM, let me containerize that for you, LMCTFY, LMCTFY. Let me containerize that for you, uh, which is basically our container format, uh, open sourced. Uh, but Docker have kind of beat us to it as well. Uh, we never really kind of pushed that project further than uh, just making it available. So ultimately, we can run all of our work uh, on these machines via Borg. Uh, this is our scheduler. Ultimately, uh, how are we doing? Yeah. Ultimately, we had two systems initially before we had Borg. Uh, one was called a global work queue, and we would run batch workloads on that. The other one was called Babysitter. We would run production workloads on that. And ultimately, uh, it, we came to our senses, and we decided to run both batch workloads and production workloads on a single cell together. And this actually means running on the same machines, because we run multiple task per machines, as we'll see shortly. Uh, and that's interesting. So we're running low priority jobs uh, with high priority production jobs, like Gmail and search. Uh, how do we do that? And so one of the things that comes into this is the idea of preemption, uh, the ability to preempt tasks, uh, evict tasks, uh, kick them off of machines and replace them with higher priority work, uh, and run low priority jobs when we can, when, the, when there's resources available. And this kind of shows that. This is from the Borg white paper. Uh, we have two bars, the prod bar at the top, uh, and the, uh, the non-prod bar at the bottom. Uh, there's also this uh, uh, in the legend, uh, which is all of the colors there, which is, should be moved up out of the graphic. So this is showing us task eviction rates and causes of those evictions. Evictions are effectively, you were kicked off the machine. Your job was kicked off the machine. As you can see in prod, we're blue. Uh, machine shutdowns, scheduled machine shutdowns are the main reason for production jobs being kicked off machines. This isn't a problem for us. We have multiple copies. We're going to spin that up somewhere else and kick it off. Uh, so that's never going to be a problem for us. Some of them get preempted. There are priority tiers. So some higher priority jobs can get, be picked kicked off by even higher priority jobs. If you look at the bottom, we have non-production uh, tasks. And you can see that the big gray area is preemption. Uh, they're effectively being kicked off the machine. Uh, this is to allow us to run more high priority jobs. Uh, and there's some other causes at the bottom. But you can see how this works. So effectively, we're basically sacrificing the ability to run uh, low priority jobs when we need to. Uh, and the mechanisms by which we do that will come up in, in a second. Of course. We have to ultimately run multiple tasks for machines uh, for efficiency. Uh, we looking at the CDF here. On an average, on a mean, we run about nine tasks per machine, at least at the time that this paper was written in 2013. It could be different now. Our machines have got bigger, generally. So it's likely that the numbers are different now. But at that time, we were running nine tasks per machine. And the way this all works is that if, if, you, look at, if you look at all of the work we run in a shared cell, we could effectively compress that down to the minimum number of machines we needed. And if we did that, we would get that. 
so like a 25% saving. If we were to do it the other way and have production-only workloads and non-production-only workloads on separate cells or on separate machines, we wouldn't be able to compress them so much. We wouldn't be able to do this overcommit and preemption. We would have a lot of idle uh, non-prod machines sitting around doing nothing. Okay, so we get effectively around 25% efficiency, uh, more utilization from our servers by doing it this way. And the way this works ultimately is that when you specify your ball job, uh, the job you want to run, you say how much resources you're going to need, how much CPU, how much memory, how much disk, uh, and that's the blue line there. We also have a, a resource consumption uh, graph there, which is the reality, what actually happens in real life. And we can do this because we have algorithms. Uh, we can create an algorithm that will actually predict what that usage will be over time. Uh, this is called our reservation. And so we do this constantly. We're constantly working out future reservation. And now we know what we think we're going to be needing. And we have the amount of resource requested. And we have this big green area that is potentially reusable. OK, so now this is no longer committed. Uh, it may be used. It may not be used. So effectively, this is stuff, uh, an area where we can run low priority jobs. We can actually run all of our low priority jobs in this space. Whenever we need it back, we just preempt those tasks and get it back. And so when load spikes for any reason, we can claim all of that back. Our map reduce jobs and all that go into the background for a while. They will run eventually. Uh, but we will be able to run all of our production jobs by overcommitting effectively. The other thing we do is all, also is uh, advanced bin packing for efficiency. Uh, so here what we see is uh, virtual machines. Our virtual machines are Borg jobs. They run on Borg, uh, interestingly. So they're uh, virtual machines running inside containers uh, on our infrastructure. And each one of these lines is a single machine, showing uh, memory at the bottom and CPU at the top. And you look on the left here, you see uh, we have situations where some machines have spare CPU and spare memory. And we could run stuff on them. Over the other side, though, we have situations where by, sometimes we have memory free, but no CPU, and sometimes we have CPU free, but no memory. And in those situations, we have stranded resources. There's just no way we can get access to those, those resources. In a situation where the memory is all used and we have spare CPU, we could effectively take that CPU out. Uh, we wouldn't need it because we're not using it. So resource stranding is a big problem. Uh, we can, by using advanced bin packing algorithms, we can actually avoid that and get to a situation whereby we're utilizing our, our, uh, uh, our CPU and memory very efficiently. And that's what we do. And that's where we're going to with Kubernetes. So ultimately, some observations. Uh, efficiency comes from scavenging all of these unused allocations. Uh, effective prioritization, extremely important for us. Uh, sharing resources, uh, like we saw with the uh, clusters and the cells. Uh, overcommit. Overcommit is significantly important for us. And smarter scheduling. This is why, where we're getting to with Kubernetes. Ultimately, application-centric, not machine-centric view. Uh, we don't care about the machines. They are a physical boundary. They get in the way. It's annoying. And it would be nice to be able to flatten it completely and remove any kind of physical boundary and just have a, a pure virtual resource of CPU and memory that we can run stuff off. Borg effectively gives us that. We still have this boundary. Uh, we can have bigger machines to run bigger workloads that need lots of CPUs, uh, but we can do things other ways as well. Uh, so moving towards an applica application-centric view, not a machine-centric view, is fundamental to the way we work at Google. Uh, we launch over 2 billion containers per week. Uh, this, is, again, is a fairly old number. Uh, we could be doing more, we could be doing less. Uh, but when you think of a, a container as being a process, uh, in this case, then 2 billion is not really that big a deal. You can read more about all of that stuff I just talked about in the Borg white paper. You'll have these slides. Uh, you can go to kubernetes.io to find out what I'm going to talk about now as well, which is Kubernetes. So how many of you use Kubernetes? How many of you would like to use Kubernetes? How many of you have no idea what Kubernetes is? Ah, that's pretty good. Right, OK. So ultimately, we needed something like containers in order to make boot ball possible. I hope I've established that. You know, we couldn't have done. Borg without containers. Okay? That's why we did C groups and namespaces. What we're seeing now is an inversion of that, effectively. <laughs> it's, it's the best I can do. I apologize. <laughs> you, you need, ultimately, you need something like Kubernetes in order to make containers practical. Right? I, that became very evident very quickly because of, uh, you all know what containers are, right? Yeah? Oh, I'm not going to 
I'm not going to go over this slide, but it's in the deck if you need a reminder. This fundamentally is the truth. Containers are awesome. You'll want to run lots of them. You already are running lots of them. You need something like Kubernetes to be able to manage them for you. It doesn't have to be Kubernetes. There are other options as well. We think Kubernetes is the best way, which is why we're significantly behind it, why we created it in the first place. Uh, my little story I tell people, and uh, I probably will get in trouble for just saying it one day, uh, is that we built Borg, and we've had Borg for a long time, and it's been built up and modified and added to and extended like, an hour, like a house with lots of different extensions been built all, all around it. And it's great and it really does its job for us but it would be nice to be able to sweep it all away and build up from the ground from, from, from the ground upwards uh, and that's what kubernetes is effectively doing uh, the project originally was called seven uh, and that was named after seven of nine uh, and i say and it's not exactly right but i say we call it seven of nine because it's a better bulk okay so ultimately kubernetes will be a better bulk it's not today. It doesn't do everything the ball does today, but it will be eventually. Uh, and ultimately, what we're doing here is saying we know how to build these systems. We've got a lot of legacy, a lot of technical debt within uh, Borg, but we can build this thing from the ground upwards with all of the things that we've learned over time. And so Kubernetes will effectively represent the way we do things better than the way we do things. And so Kubernetes, you've heard of it. I, the name thing is, uh, I don't know why I bothered with that. It's an older slide. It runs and manages containers for you. Uh, it's inspired and informed by our experiences uh, building Borg effectively. It supports multiple cloud and bare metal environments. It supports multiple container runtimes. There's some value of multiple. Uh, I, I would have expected there to be more container formats uh, by now. Uh, and ultimately, the goal of it is to manage applications, not machines, which sounds kind of familiar, right? Which is what we were doing with Borg. Uh, so we get to this situation whereby we have an API, a control plane. We have a bunch of machines. And that bunch of machines could be a Raspberry Pi cluster. It could be Google Cloud Platform. It could be Amazon Web Services. It could be on-premise machines. It could be Microsoft Azure. I don't have an Azure uh, component. I should add an Azure logo there, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, but you can run Kubernetes anywhere, basically, right? Uh, the Raspberry Pi cluster is real. We built, we built it. Well, we worked with somebody who built it, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it for enterprises, though. It's probably not going to get you very far. You can build lots of them. And ultimately, we have this situation where we have a control plane. We have a fleet of machines, which could be real or could be virtual. Uh, we have an interface, uh, API, CLI, UI, and that's fundamentally what Kubernetes is. Ultimately, all the things that we've learned plugged into something that you can use externally. So some of the features I want to talk about very briefly. Uh, we're doing 25 minutes on, on schedule, roughly. Uh, I want a 20-minute, 15-minute demo kind of thing. Uh, Kubernetes features, some of the things that you may not know, you may know, you may know it intimately. Uh, the things I like talking about, advanced scheduling capabilities. This is where we're going. It's not fully ball get all of that stuff about bin packing, uh, all of that stuff about prioritization is not yet in Kubernetes, but it will be. It's, we're moving towards that very, very uh, rapidly. We have things like admission control, which basically effectively gate uh, what will run on Kubernetes or on your cluster uh, before it actually gets to the point where it's being scheduled. So you, know, you, you can set things up to say, I can't run jobs like that, uh, and they never will get scheduled in the first place. Uh, we can schedule based on resources. And resources could be memory, it could be CPU, it could ultimately be disk, it could be availability of a storage device, a specific storage device, or a specific amount of storage, or it could be based on the availability of a machine with GPU or TPU, or ultimately a quantum computing qubit-based uh, 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 computer. Not yet, but in the future. So ultimately, you'll be able to have dedicated resources for doing certain workloads and be able to direct work to those particular resources. Uh, we use affinity and anti-affinity to make that work. Uh, the affinity part is, I want a GPU. So it will run the job on the machine with the, with the uh, GPU. Anti-affinity means, I don't really want these two jobs running together. Or, uh, multi-tenancy would be an example of that. Or potentially, the basic premise, which would be, I want all of my instances of my job to be running on different machines for high availability. Or in different regions, effectively, or different, uh, different effectively using federation, maybe even on different clouds. Uh, bin packing, we can do bin packing now based on our scheduler. It's a, not a very complicated algorithm, uh, but it will get more complicated. 
uh, self-healing of nodes, uh, service discovery and load balancing, horizontal scalability, both at the actual application layer and at the uh, cluster layer. Uh, we'll talk about horizontal scaling of clusters shortly. Uh, storage orchestration, which has always been a tough one. Uh, we can do that pretty well now. Uh, batch execution as well, uh, running jobs until they complete and just making sure these are not long running jobs, they just run to completion. Uh, the stuff that we do in our low priority jobs, for example. Uh, managing secrets and configuration. Uh, since I wrote, wrote this slide, lots of things have been added as well. But effectively, you look at the Borg the Kubernetes architecture, it looks very similar to what Borg is. Uh, Google Container Engine. How many of you use Google Container Engine? A few of you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good. Uh, <coughs> Container Engine. Effectively, Google manages your control plane. So normally when you spin up a Kubernetes cluster, you're you own everything. You're responsible for it all. Uh, we've been kind of slow to move towards a high availability master model. Uh, we're getting there very quickly, though. Uh, in the meantime, Google Container uh, Engine manages all of your control plane for you. Uh, we take uh, that master, we build it, uh, we manage it for you. It's a black box to you. You can get to it if you need to, uh, but you don't normally need to. And so we will make sure it's up and running. Uh, nine, nine, uh, three nines SLA on the master. Uh, we do backups, we monitor, do monitoring, we do health checks, we do auto repairs, we do restarts as needed, uh, when nodes hang and that kind of thing. Uh, we can do resizing for larger clusters and auto upgrades as well, which is coming. Uh, auto upgrades for masters is there, auto upgrades for nodes is coming, I'll talk about that later. Uh, and also, when it comes to the system components on your nodes, we build the nodes for you, obviously. Uh, I'm going to do a demo, I should have done a demo now, right? No, I'm going to do that in a second, right. I've got, it takes you like four minutes to spin up a cluster, so I want to get that running before I actually start doing the demo. Uh, so I will start that off in a second. But basically, we'll build the nodes for you, uh, then we add some things uh, that are useful to us, things like login, monitoring. Uh, we can do load balancing, uh, basically manage your ingresses for you uh, we, by providing a cloud load balancer and an external endpoint. And also, of course, we provide the runtimes for the container. Uh, so we do all of that for you. Uh, and ultimately, in terms of node management as well, we can, uh, we can do things like node upgrades. Uh, we can provide upgrades for you. At the moment, you have to do them yourself or have to say you want to do them. Different thing. You don't have to do them yourself. You have to say you want to do them. Uh, sometimes you don't want to do upgrades. You, know, you want to schedule them at times that are convenient to you. you know, upgrades generally mean outages you know, like, or, or at least less capacity. Uh, so you don't want to kind of do them arbitrarily. So we don't do them automatically. We will do in the future if you let us. Uh, but at the moment, you can update your Kubernetes version to a newer version, uh, a 1.7 to 1.8, or even a minor version. Uh, you can also do no repairs as well. So we have automatic repair for broken nodes. Uh, we also have a user interface. Uh, and I think ultimately with Puppet, what we're going to be doing is creating clusters and such like, but the management of, and such like of the running applications will be done by user interfaces. Uh, we often see people building their own user interfaces or integrating Kubernetes into their own workflows and to their own tooling and such like. Certain companies I've been to, uh, they have Kubernetes fundamentally integrated into their user interfaces, into their workflows. Uh, so, you know, Building user interfaces has never been a huge priority, uh, but we do have one and provide one with uh, Container Engine. And there's also a full audit trail. Here we, we're using Google Cloud SDK uh, to show we don't have that integrated in. Uh, it's not integrated. We don't have it. Uh, it's not integrated into the Kubernetes plugin for Puppet currently. Uh, so you can't do these things through that. But ultimately, uh, with some support from contributors, uh, Gareth can get to a point where he can do complicated things like this. Uh, but we have a full audit trail, see all of the operations, and describe individual operations and who did them. And it's in use by a lot of different companies already. Uh, there's a really, really cool sticker I've never seen before. Uh, Joe had one on our booth. It's a Pikachu sticker with a Kubernetes logo, which is like gold dust. I would really like one of those. Uh, but you can see Pokemon Go uh, runs on Kubernetes, Philips, Ocado, uh, New York Times, some really big companies uh, using Kubernetes. This is only a few of them. Uh, there's a lot more using uh, Kubernetes generally, but these people are using container engine specifically. All right, okay. So let's spin up a cluster. How many of you uh, like watching live demos? How many of you hate watching live demos? <laughs> 
I'll take the hint otherwise. All right. Well, do you like them because they always go wrong and you can laugh at me? <laughs> That's part of the fun. I know, right? So the first thing we do is we check to make sure we haven't got a cluster running. Uh, and we'll go into Container Engine. This is the Google uh, Cloud Console. And we'll just make, make sure the biggest part, the biggest failure of demos is not tearing them down correctly when you've been rehearsing them in the morning. Uh, like getting to the stage where it's half half down and half up. And uh, that's always the biggest fear. I don't have a cluster running currently. Uh, but very simply, hopefully you can see that. Can you all see that at the back? Yeah? OK, cool. Uh, I'm going to run Puppet Apply. And I have a manifest. We can look at it shortly when we get to it. I'm not going to talk about it immediately. Uh, we're going to spin up a cluster. Uh, and now I'm going to hit this and then watch and see if any kind of error messages appear immediately, which is normally what would happen. Uh, looking good so far. All right, we go back to the uh, slide deck. All right. We'll leave that cooking. Julia, I don't have a Julia Charles thing for this. It doesn't really work. It's not effective. I'll go back to that and it'll be finished. Or it have red writing. You know, when you go back to a terminal window and you see red writing, you always kind of like panic. Your heart goes, oh, no, what's going wrong? <laughs> we'll see if that's happened. Uh, I hope not. Uh, so we spin up a cluster. Takes about four minutes, as I say. I mean, it's, this is not something that's lightweight. There's lots of scripts involved in spinning up a Kubernetes node. Uh, we're trying to get it down. And apparently, 25% improvement in, one, in the 1.8 version of GKE. So that's going to be really good. So the G container module. How many people are using the G container module already? None of you. OK, so good. We have one. Uh, Nelson, is Nelson still here? He's probably gone. He's gone to do his talk. Uh, so basically, what we have is uh, Google G Compute. Uh, for Compute Engine, uh, virtual machines, uh, disk networks, G Storage for Google Cloud Storage, which is an object store, uh, 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 unstructured data, terabytes of data, like images, videos, that kind of thing. Google Cloud SQL, uh, Google GS SQL manages MySQL instances in the cloud. Uh, GDNS, uh, resource records. And the ones we're interested in today are Google GAuth, which provides an authentication mechanism by which you can authenticate to a Google Cloud Platform to do stuff. And Google G Container, which manages Google Container Engine resources, uh, effectively Kubernetes clusters. Uh, Google Cloud is the uh, puppet module for all of that. It, it installs all of them for you. Uh, the GEO module effectively is used to authenticate against the uh, APIs that we have. Uh, we use a service account or a default user account uh, as a provider. A service account is effectively a set of credentials that we can give to an application. So every time you need an application to be able to authenticate, uh, you can create a set of credentials. Uh, and basically, I, I don't do security stuff in demos generally because I tend to leak things on videos and that kind of thing. But basically, the mechanism is we go and create a service account in the Google Cloud Console. It will give us uh, a credential file, a JSON file, that we can then plug in to our, uh, to our puppet, uh, our puppet uh, manifests. Uh, we can also use a de default user account, which plugs into Google Cloud SDK. Uh, this is the tool that we use to deploy things to Google Cloud Platform. Uh, you can rely on that to provide all of the credentials for you. The service account effectively allows you to do it anywhere. Uh, if you use a default user account, you'll do it on somewhere where you're already doing stuff with Google Cloud. And the other thing will be the scopes. Uh, scopes are effectively privileges for certain products or uh, areas. Uh, things like Compute Engine, Container Engine, uh, Read, Write, Full Access, all of those kind of things are scopes. Uh, and you provide scopes and you say, I want to restrict this service account to these scopes. Uh, so basically, when you're at executing actions against GCP, you will create one of these uh, service accounts uh, and uh, provide the scopes, and it will restrict that to doing the things that you want it to be able to do. And ultimately, what happens with this is that we uh, create a G container cluster using the G container module. Uh, we provide the context, the zone, which is the zone within a region where you want the cluster to be, be created. Uh, the project, uh, we have this kind of boundary layer called a project, which is effectively a collection of GCP resources. Uh, it's very useful. Uh, it's quite a tight boundary. But it's, if you want to talk to things outside of the project, uh, you have to kind of go uh, a little bit out, not all the way out, but kind of out of your project and back into another project. Uh, we're trying to work to make projects less, uh, more fungible. You know, they can move things between them. Uh, but some of our internal infrastructure doesn't allow that currently. 
uh, credentials, which we just saw. And then you can specify things like initial node count, uh, the node configuration, what the machine type is, what the size of the disk is, all of that. And it's not limited to those. There's lots more, which is the ellipses at the bottom there. Uh, but I didn't want to put too much on the slide. And then there's a thing called a node pool. Uh, when you want to add more machines uh, to uh, Google Container Engine, you add node pools. And node pools could be the same machines as you have already, or they could be different configurations. They could be different sizes in terms of resources, or they could have CPU, uh, GPUs or TPUs, uh, those kind of resources. They could be very specific about what they can do. Uh, and so you create a node pool. Again, you provide a configuration. You can turn auto scaling on, which we're going to do in a second. And then you can provide all of the credentials, including the cluster you want the node uh, pool to be created under. So let's do more of a demo. And let's go back to, uh, go back to what we were cooking earlier and see what happened. Yes. No red. That's good, right? So we've got a cluster. So we go back into the Google Cloud Console now. We can find our cursor. We now have a cluster. It's got two machines. It's only got two CPUs. I created a very uh, small cluster uh, for specific reasons. OK, all right, so we had that. That's great. Uh, and we can clear that. Oops. Well, I can't type today. My typing's always been the worst. Uh, I'm thinking about something else, and I can't multitask very well. Uh, that's why I'm a klutz. I tend to fall over things. Uh, so right, we have a cluster. Uh, we can then do puppet resource uh, Kubernetes underscore node. So the, uh, the plugin we've been using, or the, the module we've been using is written by Gareth. Uh, I met him today for the first time. Uh, and more work has been done on that to make it more functional. Uh, at the moment, it can create clusters and such like. Uh, it can, or it can create, uh, not clusters, it can create uh, pods, deployments, uh, services, uh, various resources like that. And we can look at nodes as well using it. Uh, so we can do that. We'll get back from the API. And we can just filter that. And you see we have our nodes. OK, that's good. What we're going to do now is add a node pool. Uh, so first, let's look at the manifest. Uh, so I'm going to do code. Now, I didn't want to bring up the credentials file. Uh, wonderful. That's on video now. And we'll delete that service account later. See, if you don't do things exactly to your script for your demo, like GKE style, suddenly it all goes wrong. So this is what it looks like. We have a credential defined, uh, my cred. Uh, we define it as a service account, and we define our scopes. In this case, we're saying Google Cloud Platform, which basically gives us all access to Google Cloud Platform. You would probably lock this down to restrict it to Container Engine, specifically. Uh, and there's also IAM roles as well, uh, which we won't talk about, but they also uh, interact with service accounts as well. Uh, also, we're specifying the cluster ID via the environment. We have uh, two facts uh, being passed in through the environment, which is a credential file and the cluster ID, which is what we're using to build the cluster ID down here. G container cluster, uh, and then we're specifying initial node count of two, uh, no config, very simple, and then we're providing the context. We're also in order to be able to use Gareth's plugin, uh, the Kubernetes plugin, we're actually pulling down the credentials uh, from the Kubernetes cluster and storing them locally so we can actually authenticate uh, via that other plugin. Uh, and that's what we do with the uh, .kub and the uh, .puppet uh, labs etc puppet uh, directory. And ultimately, this is other stuff, kube config, which is something that Nelson added very recently, which allows us to do that and effectively authenticate against the API. Uh, the next thing is a, a node pool. And a node pool, as I mentioned, allows us to add machines, uh, all of the item potent stuff there. Uh, pretty much the same way as we've done with the cluster. We can say initial node count, cluster ID, this is a target cluster, uh, the configuration. And we're enabling auto scaling here. We're saying minimum node count is two, max node count is five. Uh, and I'm going to leave that as it is. Uh, uh, and there's the context at the bottom. So now let's create a node pool. And we'll do puppet apply. Any idea why we can't do 
puppet apply with multiple manifests. I find that surprising. It seems like it would be easier to. Is there any way to do it? You're all really knowledgeable about puppet. If there is, tell me. It might help the demo. Uh, but I have lots of manifests to use in a minute. I have to do them one by one, which is, or I can write a script to do it. Okay, so now we're creating a no pull. Again, we hope for no errors, which is good. We're on our way, we'll go back to our slide deck. So now we're creating some extra nodes. Uh, that was two nodes, auto scaling up to five. Good, that's nice. Auto scaling, uh, so we can auto scale in two different ways. Uh, we can, within Kubernetes itself, we have horizontal pod scaling. Uh, that means basically we will say, I want to run the application with <coughs> X number of containers. You're all familiar with what a pod is, right, in K Kubernetes? Anybody not familiar with a pod? Okay, so basically the pod auto scaling will say, uh, I have X number of pods, which are my application instances effectively running in the cluster. Uh, and if I turn on pod auto scaling on for that uh, particular deployment, I will scale dynamically as load increases or as, as utilization of my machines increases. Uh, we will add more pods uh, as needed on demand. Uh, we will monitor that, add them more. At some point, we may get to a situation where we have no more capacity on our cluster. Uh, and in which case, we will want to add more machines to our cluster. And that's where cluster autoscaler comes in. In GKE, this is in beta. Uh, you can do this with Kubernetes as well, uh, anywhere. Um, if you do it on-premise, though, you probably have to automatically fill in a purchase order, send it off to Dell, get a machine delivered back to you. Uh, so autoscaling on-premise on is more difficult, uh, I found. as a joke. <laughs> uh, we do it this way, we have a node pool manager, so we have a, a thing called manage instance groups. Uh, we have a, a, a group of machines, which is our node pool. Uh, they're constantly being monitored. We can create new machines. We're monitoring the health of them to make sure they're healthy. Uh, and the autoscaler is uh, plugged into the control plane. If we ever get to a situation where we can't schedule pods, uh, we will then trigger an autoscale event. We will add a machine. If we get to a situation where we have a machine that's uh, effectively one machine available, uh, we could effectively move that machine away. Uh, Downscaling or descaling, I used to call it descaling, which I think is great, much better term. Downscaling the cluster and removing the machine is a bit more complicated because you have to reschedule all of the other uh, running uh, services. Uh, that may not be an impact, uh, but it needs consideration. It needs to be done in a meaningful way. Uh, like tearing machines up, adding machines and removing them, adding machines and removing them is not a good way. We are very lazy when it comes to downscaling. Uh, we're very quick when it comes to upscaling. We still have to bring the node up. Uh, for downscaling, we take our time about it. You may want that back again. We don't want to keep adding it, turning it down, adding it, turning it down. So that's how uh, autoscaler works. It will scale to zero. So we can create a node pool with zero nodes. So we're not paying for anything until we need it, uh, which is really cool. Need that. Uh, preemptible VMs as well. So we can also build clusters using preemptible virtual machines, which are cheaper, uh, very much cheaper than uh, regular uh, virtual machines. And I'm not sure that price is right. Uh, it may be wrong. I copied this slide from an older deck of mine. Uh, but basically, preemptables will run for up to 24 hours uh, before they're preempted. Uh, they're kicked off. They're low priority jobs, run on Borg. Uh, and they're guaranteed to run for 24, well, not guaranteed to run. They can run for a maximum time uh, up to 24 hours. Uh, they may be preempted at any time within that interval. Uh, but if you're running an auto scaling pool or a, a pool, a, a, a node pool, we will always try to make sure you have the right number of machines. So if one goes away, we'll add another one back, if we can. If there's no capacity for preemptibles, uh, you won't be able to get those machines back. You may have to wait. So you could have a very low priority cluster. Uh, run this work whenever you can. I'm only going to pay the preemptible prices. So effectively, those machines will get preempted. They will go away. If they can come back, because if there's resources and capacity to add them back, then they will come back. Uh, so it's a very good way of actually running clusters for low priority work. Uh, new and coming, uh, per second billion, uh, available now. Uh, per second billion is great. Uh, HA, multi-master container engine clusters. Uh, we can run across multiple zones or a region. Uh, Kubernetes node problem detector, uh, node auto upgrade, maintenance windows, uh, the kind of thing we were talking about earlier. Cluster auto scaling up to 1,000 nodes uh, and NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPUs. And the last thing I'm going to do is just do a bit more of a demo on the cluster stuff. Uh, the node pool is still coming up. And 
go into the resources while we're waiting for that to finish. So you can find out more, of course, about uh, the Google modules uh, at forge.public.com slash Google. Uh, the modules on GitHub are all there listed. Again, you'll have these slides. Uh, Google Container Engine is cloud.google.com Container Engine. Kubernetes, kubernetes.io, and the Kubernetes module is uh, garifar slash Kubernetes. There's also another talk after this one, 11.45, uh, in the Franciscan Ballroom, uh, where Nelson, who developed the modules, is going to be giving a talk about all of the modules, not just the container one. And he'll be joined by Cody from Puppet. And I'm going to go back and hope that my module is finished now. Right, so we're now we're, we're done. Uh, and we'll very quickly run through the last part of the demo. And basically, you can see we have, now have four uh, machines in our cluster, which is great. Uh, I'm going to clear this. And so now, if I go into this directory here, we have a, an actual application that we want to run on Kubernetes. Uh, we have a bunch of YAML files, uh, standard format for uh, Kubernetes. We're going to convert these uh, into public manifests. Uh, and I'm going to cheat and just pull it from my history. Uh, and hopefully, this will just convert them all. So effectively, I'm doing Puppet Kubernetes Convert. Uh, so you get this with the module, uh, the ability to convert these manifests into Puppet uh, these YAML manifests into puppet manifests. And that will happen now. And then we can deploy them. And I'm going to speed things up a bit. First thing I'm going to do is deploy a Redis master and a Redis slave. But this I need some I need a deployment and I need a service. Uh, so I'm going to do that first. This is why I was complaining about not being able to do multiple uh, manifests on the command line. So first I deploy the master uh, and then the service. And then I'm going to uh, deploy the slave. And we can do a watch over here. Uh, We'll watch what we're doing. We now have the Redis master up and running. So now we're going to do the slave in service first. And then do the deployment. So that's going to add the slave deployment. That's going to ask for two nodes, uh, which are not up and running yet, but will be up and running very soon. Now I'm going to deploy the front end. Uh, and puppet apply. This one's going to ask for more pods than we can actually run. It's going to ask for four, but it won't be able to run four. Uh, we don't have the capacity currently to run this. This is quite a resource intensive process. Not really, I just made it. So I just added the parameters inside the uh, manifest to say, you need half a CPU to be able to run one of these instances, one of these pods. Uh, so now it's saying I can't actually run this currently. If we were to do kubectl get events minus minus watch. Whoops, I can't spell kubectl. We'll see that it will come up saying, uh, in a second, it will say that it can't schedule them. Oh, it did schedule them. <laughs> OK, that didn't work. See, my demo broke, but I ran out, ran out of time anyway. So anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. I will put the demo, the full demo, up online on YouTube, uh, and you can find it. I'll tweet it later as well, once I've done it. Uh, but thank you. Uh, and if you need to ask questions, come and find us on the Google booth. I'll be there for another couple of hours. I'll be there all across lunchtime. Thank you very much. <laughs>